Arabic Speak English this conference. Um, my name is Alex Kilgar. I'm a geriatrician um, from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and I've come to give a presentation on some recent work that I've been doing. Um, I thought everybody's brains would be getting tired by this time of the day. This is a picture of Edinburgh Castle, which sits atop a volcano. Um, so I thought I'd show you an image of something non-sarcopenic. And for anyone who's been to Scotland, they'll know what's very interesting about this image is it's not raining and it appears to be sunny. Um, and as you'll see, I had to take this photo from 2006 to identify this image. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about why um, I did this study. Then I'm going to describe the methods we use to do the study, talk through the results we found, and then have a discussion about the limitations and future work um, that could come from this. So, as we know, current imaging tests used to measure muscle bulk and studies of sarcopenia include full body DEXA and imaging of a large muscle group, commonly the quadriceps. This can either be a cross sectional area or um, a volume reconstruction. And the inference of using one muscle group is that one muscle group may infer a general muscle bulk. However, longitudinal aging studies rarely include either of these measures, but frequently do include an MRI brain scan. So therefore, a technique to measure muscle bulk on MRI brains would allow sarcopenia to be studied in ongoing longitudinal aging studies without requiring an additional test. And as luck would have it, um, I have designed a technique for measuring neck muscle cross-sectional area on MRI brain scans. And um, I've shown that it is feasible, it has a good inter-rater reliability and good repeatability. But the measure is of no importance really if neck muscle cross-sectional area is not a good indicator of general muscle bulk, as quadriceps, for example, appears to be. So um, we decided to study to test this, um, and we selected 25 participants of the Lillian Birth Cohort 1936 study at random. And this photograph is a picture of some of the members of this cohort study. Um, this study is in interesting because um, in 1947 in Scotland, everybody um, who was aged 11 and had been born in 1936 sat an IQ test. And they were looking to see whether um, boys were more intelligent than girls. Um, funnily enough, they found out that the mean intelligence for boys and girls is the same. Uh, and the data was shelved until about the year 2000 when my professor, who's standing in the with the green tie in front of that picture, and um, rediscovered the data and rerouted these participants to take part in an aging study with the benefits of having their IQ measured at age 11. As part of the Lillian Birth Cohort study, uh, all these participants have had a recent MRI T1 volume brain scan, and in fact, they had another one previously three years ago. So we used our previously developed technique to measure neck muscle cross-sectional area on these scans. Um, the participants also then had a mid-thigh MRI scan, that's the 25 participants we recruited, and we measured the mid-thigh muscle cross-sectional area on this scan. So I thought I'd mention uh, the technique we used for measuring neck muscle cross-sectional area. Um, first of all, on the sagittal plane, we find the slice where the C2 vertical body height is at its maximum, and on the left of the screen there you can see a line diagram of roughly what this looks like. Uh, we identify the midpoint of the C2 vertebral body height, including the odontoid peg, using cursors. Um, and once we've identified the midpoint, um, the, we switch to the transverse view. We then use a freehand cursor to outline the muscles, and each muscle measurement is performed three times, and a median value is taken for the right and left sides. This is um, an image of an MRI brain scan and transverse view of roughly the C2 height. And these are the muscles we're looking at. Um, as you can see, they are quite small. Um, there's five muscles we look at in total. Uh, the one outlined in purple is the obliquus capitis inferior, and that's a short oblique muscle in the center neck. Then we have the sternocleidomastoid, as you know, runs down the outside of the neck. And then three strap muscles at the posterior neck, the splenius capitis, the semispinalis capitis, and the trapezius muscles image of the mid thigh, which we decided to split up into three muscle groups. Uh, the anterior group includes the quadriceps and sartorius, the medial group, which was the gracilis and adductor group, and the posterior group of the hamstrings. Um, we identified the mid thigh as the midpoint between the um, protuberance of the greater trochanter and the superior order of the patella. We marked this spot with a codliveral capsule to allow us to identify it on the MRI scans. So, to go through our results, 25 subjects underwent both a brain scan and a mid thigh MRI scan. However, one patient did not tolerate the full MRI brain scan due to claustrophobic symptoms. Therefore, we're unable to 
muscular group, and an independent two test found that total neck muscle cross sectional area and total thigh muscle cross sectional area were significantly different between the male and female subgroups. So this is a, a scatter graph of the total neck cross sectional area um, against the total mid thigh cross sectional area, and it implies there would be a good correlation. And in fact, the co Pearson's correlation coefficient is 0.876 which gives an R squared percentage of 76.7%. Principal con component analysis showed that the first unrotated principal component of neck muscle cross sectional area explains 72.2% of the variance. We then performed multiple linear regression, which derived the following formula, um, which would allow us to predict neck muscle cross sectional area from total thigh cross sectional area, and clearly with algebra, you could reverse the equation if you so wished. These preliminary data suggest that posterior neck muscle cross section area, which is commonly visual, visible on MR or CT volume brain scans, can be used in place of thigh muscles as an index of general muscle bulk in studies where imaging of a large muscle group is not available. And therefore, a neck muscle could be used combined with a measure of muscle function to estimate sarcopenia in these studies. This is particularly interesting as longitudinal studies of aging commonly do include a T1 volume MRI brain scan and no other measure of muscle bulk. And this will allow the wealth of variables already collected as part of these studies to be researched as possible correlates of sarcopenia. There is also now widespread use of volume CT and MRI brain scans in routine clinical practice, therefore allowing the possibility of this becoming a clinical tool also. There are limitations of this study, generalizability, um, the study recruits are all from South East Scotland, therefore there's not a wide ethnic spread. We are all of a very narrow age range and of a narrow geographical location. Um, the LBC 1936 volunteers, as they're volunteers as part of a longitudinal health study, are of a slightly higher educational standard than um, the representative population and slightly um, higher health as well. The neck and thigh muscles represent different muscle types, the neck muscle being a primarily postural muscle, the thigh muscles having a large basic um, section to them. Therefore, there could well be variations between type 1 and type 2 muscle fiber um, proportions within these muscles, and therefore they may age differently. And the study only involved a small number of participants. Therefore, further studies are required in larger data sets of different ages and ethnicities to confirm this association between thigh and neck muscles and to validate this equation. This is Ray Moon, who is at 81, the oldest competitive bodybuilder in the world, which I thought was impressive. <laughs> um, so, in conclusion, the neck muscle cross section area <coughs> using our proposed technique is a good measure of general muscle bulk. This technique could be used to study sarcopenia in longitudinal aging studies, which include an MRI brain scan when combined with a measure of muscle strength. I would just like to thank my co-authors and the collaborative staff I've been working with, and I'll leave up my contact details in case anybody would like to contact me about possibly using this technique or any um, advice they feel they could offer. Thank you very much for your attention.
question of the lady from Verona earlier. Unfortunately, uh, the technique that her lab uses is slice-o-matic. There's other imaging software available for looking at intramuscular fat. Um, and perhaps if I go back to the image of the neck muscle. Um, as you can see, the neck muscles are very small compared to muscles which are um, ordinarily looked at. And when using the previously um, invented technology to look at fat infiltration, they just don't seem to work on the neck muscles. In fact, this is probably is a uh, MRI scan from a younger subject because the muscles are actually slightly more clear than what I see in my 70 plus year old age group. Um, so it, it's something that we're very interested to have a think about, but unfortunately the technology we've found so far just haven't been able to do it. But if you have any suggestions, that would be great. Thank you. 